Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. It's great to be back on the set. It's been a couple months now since I've actually recorded something. Uh, sometime in July, I think it was. Uh, took the whole month of August and almost all of September off here. Um, so a recap of what was going on uh, during that time. Really, it's it, for, for wine. Uh, I didn't do a whole heck of a lot. I did go to Texom, as I do every year. I volunteered 100% of the time there, whereas last year I was volunteering and then doing competition. Uh, good news is, didn't have any sciatica like last year, so that was great. Uh, I show up uh, on Thursday, kind of afternoon-ish, and I walk in and Bill Elsie's telling me that uh, almost all the glasses are polished. And I was like floored because when I went up last year, it was, I went up on a Tuesday, but uh, we didn't finish glasses till like Friday. So, and these guys didn't start till like Wednesday. So um, kudos to everybody who, who polished glasses before I got there. All I, you know, all I did was, uh, I was like, like the closer in baseball. They set you up and then, not that I polished the rest, but you know, they set everything up and then I, I walk in, it wasn't that, it wasn't that much of a, uh, of a deal. But um, had a great time up there, uh, met a whole bunch of cool new people that I'd never met before. Some of these people have been going to Texon for a while. Um, the volunteer part, I mean, that's where I, to me, that's kind of like a lot of the, uh, a lot of networking there. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging out with fellow Psalms, uh, enthusiasts, uh, wine, you know, uh, uh, wine distributors, um, you know, people just all over the wine industry and uh, got to see some old friends from last time. You know, I got to meet some new friends, and uh, the Psalm Lounge was great. It was on the first floor instead of having to go up, because the Psalm Lounge on the second floor was kind of like, eh, yeah, I'll get there. It was so convenient where it was this year. You know, uh, of course, Drew and, Drew and James, they're the founders of it, but June, you, you kicked ass, uh, according to everything, along with, with David and Bill uh, and, and Mark, and uh, let's see <laughs> McFall, Chris. Um, I mean, all you guys. I, I, I'm probably gonna forget people that were in charge of stuff, but um, all you, all, all you guys that that were in charge and directing Julie, um, and then Martin and uh, um, uh, damn it, I can't believe I'm uh, forgetting names. Scott, um, Nathan. You know, these, these, I mean, I'm just trying to run the list of everybody that, that was helping. Um, I think I got mostly everybody that were, that were in the Psalm group, but all of you did awesome job of, of coordinating stuff. And then just shout out to the, uh, the wine, the, the wine vendors, uh, for, especially on the, uh, uh, the lunches. Uh, I missed the first lunch, uh, which I could have gone, but I was like, I got there actually in the morning on Thursday. But I took my time, checked in my hotel, got my hair cut, had lunch. Had lunch at a really cool place. Um, I don't remember the name. But it was like Taco, not Taco Garage, Taco something. I don't remember. It's in the shopping center on MacArthur Highway and um, and uh, uh, Carpenter, MacArthur and Carpenter. And uh, I got there like 1130-ish and it wasn't too terribly busy. Uh, and it was like 110 degrees outside. Okay, like 100 degrees outside. And I almost sat outside, but I was like, nah, they had misters. I said, I'll sit inside. In like 15 minutes, the place was filled up. And I had this um, uh, amazing dish that was a uh, tamale with uh, brisket. And oh my goodness, it was phenomenal. <laughs> like it's, it's on the list of things that I have to go eat every year at. So, But uh, I went to a hotel, took a nap, blah, blah, blah. So I did stay at the La Quinta this year. Um, Four Seasons, you guys are awesome. Um, but the popularity of the, you know, Hey, don't feel, don't, don't, um, uh, 
I shouldn't complain the, the fact that the, that the conference is so successful that you're able to charge a little bit more. I mean, the rates were still a good discount. And, they, and the person tried to get me into something at a great discount, let me tell you. But it just was out of my budget. And I was able to stay across the street for literally half price. I mean, yeah, actually more than half price from what they were going to give me uh, at the Four Seasons, even though it would have been spectacular. Uh, so next year, maybe I'll stay at the Four Seasons. I'll probably stay at La Quinta again. Uh, it's a good hotel. It's fairly, it's, it's new. It's only been there for a few years. Um, a lot of the, a lot of us were staying over there. Um, so that, that was cool. And, uh, I mean, the Four Seasons staff, uh, you guys rocked it, helped us out with, with the, uh, with the thing. Um, got to meet Levy Dalton. Uh, he is awesome. We talked for like all of like five seconds, it felt like. Um, so hopefully next year or hopefully in the, in the next 11 months ish, uh, one of us will be in the other's town and maybe we can actually get together and actually have a dinner or a lunch and sit down and just chit chat or whatever. Um, still holding you to get, get on the show, Levy. Uh, you're going to be on my show. Uh, so if you don't know who he is, he has a podcast named I'll Drink to That. Um, if you're in the industry, it's to me required listening. I mean, you have a commute, just pop it in. He does two interviews a week. They're about an hour long, super informative. He interviews literally everybody in the business. I mean, just Everybody. Um, and then, uh, uh, I forgot where my train of thought was with that. But, oh, and if you're not in the business and you just want to learn some, you want to hear some cool stories and learn some history and, and learn some knowledge, um, because Aaron Scala does some, uh, uh, these, they're called warm ups. And at first I thought they was, the first time I heard them it was like during winter. So I thought she was just saying, you, are you ready to get warmed up? Because it was cold in New York. And then I realized it's actually the warm up into the podcast. Yeah, it took me like months to figure that out. Because um, I'm like, dude, it's like June. Why are, you calling, why are you still saying you're ready to get warmed up? It's already hot. But um, I figured out that that was what they were calling it. But she, she, she dropped some awesome knowledge. I mean, she compresses it in about five minutes or less. So, I mean, she can't go too terribly deep. But let me tell you, what she does tell you is awesome stuff. Um, but so if you're, if, you're, even if you're not in the industry, if you just want to learn some more about wine and hear some really cool stories from really cool people, you should do it. Um, so kudos to that. And Levy, I listened to well the first three of your Texas ones. I know you have one more. I just saw my phone pop up. Um, so I got another Texas uh, person to listen to. So uh, um, the first three were great that I listened to. June, Devin Rogley, and uh, June uh, Rodil, uh, and then David Keck. Uh, so those three. And um, awesome, awesome job on all three of those. And all three of you were interviewed. You did great. I learned I learned a lot more about you. It was awesome. Um, let's see. I'm trying to get through all the housekeeping, then we'll get to the wines. Um, outside of that, you know, besides just Texan was awesome time, and I stayed one more day because that Monday night ended up being a really late night, and I didn't have to be back in town for another day. So kudos to La Quinta for letting me stay one more day. Uh, that was fine. Um, I was able to relax instead of, like, you know, having to pack up everything by checkout time, which, honestly... When I went back to sleep after I said, hey, can I stay another day? I woke up in time to, if I wanted to leave, I could have left. And I thought about it. But I was like, nah, I'll stay another day. Um, but anyway, uh, great trip up to Dallas. Got to see a good friend of mine, Chris, who's a bartender of the, uh, at uh, Bob's Chop House, uh, Chop and Steakhouse, or Steakhouse and Chop House, whatever it is. Bob's up at the Omni. Uh, if you, if you want to have a good, a good steak up in Dallas, yes, I work for a steakhouse. I won't tell you which one, but it's not hard to figure out. Go to my steakhouse too. We have great steaks, but you know, uh, if you want some uh, a cool guy to take care of you, Chris at the bar, he's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, I almost had the taco place in. I'll, I'll figure it out by the end wh where I went to. Anyway, um, I think that's it for the housekeeping. Other than, um, yeah, and then I pretty much have just taken a break with wine. I mean, I've done my SOM meetings, but um, that's that's really it. I've been so stoked now. So I've been so stoked to get into um, these wines that we're going to do. I'm recording three episodes tonight. Um, and they're all French wines. Um, they're from Somme Select. So Somme Select, real quick, they are um, an, an outfit, a, a, 
online wine ordering place. Ian Cobble, um, if you've ever watched the movie Psalm, he is uh, one of the one of the Psalms that was attempting to pass the master exam. Um, so I don't know. We're talking two, three, two to three years after all that. Um, he started up a uh, basically a, an online wine retail uh, called Psalm Select, and uh, he gives you a little rundown. It's a daily deal. Gives you a little rundown. The prices look like they're pretty reasonable or pretty fair as to what these uh, wines would retail normally. Um, they're one of other wine retailers out there online that I have used. Uh, Underground Seller, again, I, I use them a lot. But Psalm Select, so um, I buy a wine, and you can buy as many as you want, but I usually buy one bottle typically, though a couple of these I have an extra bottle of. Um, so you buy a bottle, and you can have it shipped right then and there, or you can do what's called hold and consolidate. And once you reach 12 bottles, they automatically ship it to you. Now, when I actually reached my 12th bottle, because I took my time doing this, because uh, I did buy some more expensive wines through this, through this than through Underground Cellar or just going to like you know a, wine, a retailer locally. Um, so uh, uh, when I did that, they actually sent an email saying, "How do you want it shipped?" And I could have had it shipped, you know, regular, you know, regular shipping, but in you know uh, uh, a container with ice packs and all that. It didn't cost me any extra. Now you pay, so for the hold and consolidate, I don't know why I'm touching the wine. For hold and consolidate, it's when you do that, they charge 10% of the uh, wine cost for, no, I think it's like 1%. I don't know. It's cheap. You know, I'm going to look, I'm going to look up one of these wines real quick on my, uh, on my email while I talk about it, which of course I, I closed my email because I didn't want to get notifications, but they charge a small percentage as your shipping fee or as the fee to hold the wine and then you don't pay any extra shipping. Whereas, you know, when you buy wine online, sometimes shipping is like 15 bucks. The bottle of wine is 20. So these places that you buy it from, make sure you do the, the cheapest way to ship like free shipping or whatever. So, um, anyway, bum, bum, bum. Of course, got emails here that they're distracting me. So I'm going to look up one of these and see how much they charge me for uh, shipping. But um, and if you, if you buy a certain number of wines, if I remember correctly, uh, you want to ship immediately, it's free shipping. Um, but anyway, um, they seem to be cool. Um, matter of fact, when they're shipping my wines, they called me and said, hey, we dropped one of your bottles. <laughs> and can we replace it with something else? Like I had like I had like more than 12 at this point. And I was like, I just ordered a wine like the day before or whatever. And I was like, yeah, just send that one and hold the other one. Um, so that's what they were doing for me. Um, here we go. So, um, yeah, it's 1%. 1% of uh, your cost is uh, they use for shipping. All right, so let's get into the wine. First wine, uh, this is... The 2011 Chateau Tessier, T-E-Y-S-S-I-E-R, Tessier, 2011, from Saint-Emilion. Uh, this is a Grand Cru, so uh, Saint-Emilion has their own little, like, um, ranking or classification system. Um, you have uh, Premier Cru, you have, like, Class A, uh, you know, Class A or whatever, and you've got, like, I think now it's, like, four chateaus in there, and we're talking, like, uh, uh, um, what should I call it? Um, now I can't believe I just drew a blank on that. Like Osson and um, what should I call it? Cheval Blanc. Those those guys are in that top tier. Then you have Premier Crew. Then you have Grand Crew, and then pretty much that's it. Okay. So um, so a little bit about uh, this. Oh, I bought it for thirty six dollars. So this is actually the cheaper of the two wines. Um, before I do that, I've been noticing I keep forgetting to uh, do the little, the little priming of the needle when I'm using this, whether on the show or at or just for regular drinking. And one thing about doing that is you know whether or not you have gas in the canister. And I'll be honest, I don't. I'm assuming I can get through all these wines tonight. Um, just because I have used the Coravin, you know, for home use, 
over the past couple months. Um, so I might be close to that 15 glass, you know, when you get to 15 glasses, but um, I don't know, and I don't have any more canisters if I remember correctly, so I need to, need to go buy some more. All right, so um, anyway, so this uh, being a right bank wine, um, it's, it's the stereotypical Merlot-based wine. It's 85% Merlot, 15% Cabernet Franc, and that's actually kind of typical for right bank uh, wines is that it's Merlot and Cabernet Franc. Um, as the two grapes that they usually use. Um, it doesn't mean they can't use any of the others, you know, Cab, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Petit Verdot, or Malbec, or, or, or Carmen Air. Um, so, uh, um, but typically they, they do the two. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, so the estate was predominantly a farm in the 18th century until it was acquired by the historian Jules, Jules Roy in 1869. Uh, he, constructed, he constructed the chateau and structured the vineyards. Um, then, basically, over the years, it was neglected, and it was neglected and, and I guess, shrunk down to a five-hectare estate uh, when Jonathan and Lynn Maltus arrived in 94 and purchased it. Um, so then they went through the... the they went through the process of modernizing and all that kind of stuff. And they acquired additional parts in Viognier, uh, Saint-Sulpice, de Fallenrens, and in Saint-Emilion. Um, let's see. Uh, Jonathan Maltus is frequently termed a gar gar garagiste, winemaker or cult winemaker. He collaborates with enologist Neil White and consultant enologist Giles Pauquet. Uh, t -t 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 -t. He also has some wineries, uh, wine projects in um, Barossa in the Eden Valley, and uh, he's uh, t -t 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 -t. he also had a has a venture in Napa Valley, and they produced um, some wines in 2011. The name of that winery is World's End. Um, and let's see, he he acquired the remainder of Vu Chateau Maserat. Uh, neighboring the state of Chateau Angeles, another Premier Cru Class A, or yeah, Grand Cru, I'm sorry, Grand Cru Class A, uh, Premier Cru, I'm sorry. Um, adding six hectares to the plot they brought in 96, and it produces the fruit for Les Dômes. All right, so that was the, the uh, two minute introduction to that. So, in other words, the grapes have been there for a while, or they, the, 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 property has been there for a while and uh the people who own it have been doing it for what 20 years now a little over 20 years well on the nose um some red fruits Um, some spiciness to it, like pepper, like black pepper. Um, yeah, kind of peppery, some red fruit, but I don't get anything specific. <laughs> it feels like there's like, there's like, um, pepper going up my nose. And that, that's predominantly what I get. Let's see what it is on the palate. Um, again, spicy, peppery, um, maybe something like, uh, 
almost want to say nutmeg, but something along those lines. Um, and on the red fruit side, maybe some, maybe some raspberry on that, uh, maybe some blackberry. Yeah, probably more blackberry, but it's kind of peppery. Um, I can kind of feel, I can kind of feel a little bit of alcohol, but it's only 13.5. It's not, it's by no means hot, okay? But I, I can kind of feel it a little bit. Um, there's something else to it. I mean, kind of a cedar box to it. It's more, quote, mineral, mineral or minerality to it than fruit. Um, but kind of cedar box a little bit. Um, maybe even a little bit of, of well, not quite chalkiness, but, but flintiness to it. Um, blackberries. Maybe some of that raspberry, but it feels like it's darker fruit. Um, this, you know, you're not going to confuse this for, you know, a fruit bomb from Napa. Um, you know, hey, I had some three palms earlier at lunch today. Would never confuse this for, for three palms Merlot, okay? Um, you know, you, this, this really because of it's, it's not such a fruit forward wine. It's more of a, um, an earthy wine. Would totally take me into being a um, old world wine. Um, and this feels like a very serious wine. It's only, I'm going to say only 36 bucks. But when we talk about wines or when I think about wines being serious, you know, at retail prices, you know, they're usually not 20 bucks and under. I mean, I'm not saying they're not good wines, but you know, you have that, that extra bit of quality and that care taken to it. Um, this is, this is a really nice wine. Uh, I want to see if there's anything else. I did say spicy, velvety, rich. I could see velvety a little bit, yeah, but it's definitely spicy, um, with a hint of like darker fruits, almost like black fruits to it. For thirty six bucks, uh, it's not you're not gonna go wrong with it. Um, I don't. I feel like I paid a good value for it. Let's put it that way. I like it. If you like Merlot based wines, if you like right bank wines, this is this will be a good wine for you. If you're not into this type of wine, then you're probably not going to like it, especially if you're into New World wines. Matter of fact, this show and the next two, if you don't like New World wines, well, that's what I'm, I'm drinking is Old World here. But it's good. I like it a lot. Well, I like it. I like it. You know, I, I, I want to have some food with it. Uh, tannin wise, it was, it's not too, it's not too tannic either. It was actually, I want to call it easy drinking. It's not coughable, but you know, it's got a little bit of, a little bit of grip, you know, on the gums, but nothing like, nothing like in your face. And I kind of like that, you know, I mean, I work in, I work in a place that's all about Napa cabs and, and not that I drink a lot of those, but when I get tasted on them or we're trying to get, add stuff to the list, you know, it's Napa cab, Napa cab, Napa cab, nothing wrong with them. You know, I love them, or I like them a lot, um, but it's, 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 nice to, it's nice to drink something that wasn't a fruit bomb in my mouth, and loads of chocolate, and cherries, and cream, and vanilla. Let's put it that way. Kind of refreshing. All right, so let's move on to wine number two. All right, so wine number two. I'm really excited about trying this wine. Now this, we do sell this where I work, all right? Um, and it's one of those wines where they're not gonna bring me a sample bottle of this. Um, but um, I think it was, uh, I've been really wanting to try it. When I saw Psalm Select had this, I bought two bottles, which was a little crazy because this was not a cheap bottle of wine. Um, let's see. Matter of fact, I wanna say that, that well, at least the price I put down, I don't think that's what I paid per bottle. I think that's what I paid total. I mean, it's not cheap, let's put it that way. Um, anyway, this is the uh, La Hospitale de Gazin, or Gazin, or Gazin, um, from Pomerol, also on the right bank, 2008. Now, um, uh, 
this this um, this particular chateau, it, it, a lot of its I want to say claim to fame, but a lot of what is um, a lot of of what uh, you're going with. Yeah. Okay. So I did have it wrong. I was like, there's no way that yeah, there's no way that this cost eighty four each. It's forty two each. So forty two dollars. Um, so I need to update my notes here. So when I do the lower third, I don't screw it up. I was like, man, I know I didn't spend 160 something bucks in one transaction. Anyway, um, so this was a, started off as a farmhouse in the Middle Ages and uh, belonging to the Knights Hospital, Hospitalizers of St. John, as in, as in you know, the Apostle. Um, also thought to have a hospital, hence the name of this label, um, Gazin is, is the name of the chateau, um, on the property, um, along one of many different Camino de Santiago pilgrimage trails. Um, the one that this one's on, the trail started in Paris or Tours, what, how, however you want to do it. It, it, it officially started in Tours, but I guess it initially started there, but then, um, then they start in Paris, okay? Um, so this, this pilgrimage trail was to um, visit the tomb of um, St. James, um, sorry, St. James the Apostle, not St. John. I don't know, maybe St. John the Apostle too. Uh, but the, the trail is for to visit the tomb of St. James in the town of Santiago. Now, uh, James... Uh, spread the gospel in um, Galicia, uh, so Spain, northeastern, Sp northwestern Spain. Um, and after he, he, I guess he felt he was done there, he returned to the Holy Land, which he was quickly beheaded. So his disciples um, decided to, uh, they, were, they were able to somehow secure his body, or secure his remains, whatever you want to call it. Um, they secreted him to Galicia and buried him. So in the ninth century, uh, his, his uh, tomb was, quote, rediscovered, uh, and this led to this pilgrimage to Santiago. Um, so the property was bought in 1772 by the Fulhade family. Uh, they were one of the pioneers of local viticultural revolution uh, when production of quality wine was favored over cultivating cereal. So at the time... Um, so, so I'm sorry, not, not the property where the tomb is, this property, okay? Uh, this property they bought. So at the time, uh, cereals, cereals, grains were being produced, and uh, so they bought it to, um, uh, they bought it during the, the time when they were like changing over from uh, cereals to grapes as the main uh, product, uh, to produce quality wine. Uh, the estate became the property of the Balancourt de Cor. Croix family in 1918, who remains the owners to date. So they're not owned by some big insurance company in France or some other big corporation. Uh, the estate consists of 26 hectares with grape varieties of 90% Merlot, 7% uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and 3% Cabernet Franc. Their annual production average is 8,000 cases for the Grand, the Grand Vin, which this is not, and there's 2,000 cases of the second wine, which is this. Um, so it's kind of funny. They, they produce much less of that, but it's the grapes that didn't make it into the, to the big one. Uh, and another thing about them, it is grown in iron-rich clays. Now, this label was started in 1986, um, and they are considered the equivalent of anywhere from a second to fifth growth uh, in Bordeaux, depending on who's ranking it. Now, in Pomerol, they don't have a ranking system, an official ranking system like they do in saint uh and in the the in Bordeaux, um, and I didn't get the percentages on here in my notes as to what's what, but this is um, oh yeah no that's the other one. I don't know if it has all three grapes in it, but it's definitely vast majority Merlot, um, with maybe a little bit of Cab Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. All right, so let's check it out. If you want to read some cool stuff, read about the, the pilgrimage, um, about the trail and all the different 
play all the different trails that, that went through France. It was it was called the French Trail, the French the French Way, or something like that, um, because all the trails originally started in France. And then if you look at these trails, you'll see that they got extended into other parts of Europe. But they all converged into Spain to uh, to go to this uh, to go to Santiago. So again, uh, more earthy on the nose. Now I get a little bit of dirt on this rather than like like cedar box. Um, maybe like forest floor. I you know uh, I don't know about wet forest floor. I think it's more dry, but kind of kind of a little dirt too. And, and not quite dust, but more dirt and, and you know, dried dried leaves. Uh, force, force, force is really good way to put it. And, and maybe a hint of like, you know, maybe a hint of like manure type of thing, you know, barnyard, if you will. But not like, you know, burgundy barnyard, right? far as floral and fruit, I no, I don't get it. More acid than than this wine here. Um, it's like a mintiness to it. Um, yeah, it's like a mintiness to it. A little bit, um, a little bit more tannin. Um, some Christmas spices to it. I mean, I've get I get like clove, lots of clove. Like I wouldn't say clove for days, but lots of clove. Clove, mint, um, maybe a little like eucalyptus type stuff. Um, Maybe even a hint of something like cinnamon or, um, um, I wouldn't say maybe nutmeg, but yeah. And God, no, not pumpkin spice latte. Dude, I'm already tired of seeing everyone getting all freaking orgasmic about that shit. Oops. I mean, both wines really should have some food with it, but I really, I, this, I think it'd be great with like um, roasted meats, holiday type food, um, uh, ham, um, honey ham, that type of stuff. Um, th this wine knocks it out of the park for me. Not that this wine is bad by any means, but for what, uh, six bucks more? I, I, I'd rather go with this one. Um, I mean, I just, it, 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 it checks more boxes for me. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be disappointed. Hey, spend six bucks more and get that one. I also wouldn't be disappointed to spend 36 for this either. Okay. As far as fruit profile, not really. I mean, I would say the fruit's a little bit brighter. It's not so dark like this one. It's probably more red generic fruit. And like it has a little bit of a bite to it. Um, that food will definitely rein it in a little bit. I think it's a really good wine. Um, I'm excited about it. I bought two bottles of it. I'm happy I bought two bottles of it because it was a little bit of a little bit of a you know um, dice roll. But I think it was really good. All right, so um, I, I think I think this was probably a 40 minute show. I don't know. I, I really talked a lot at the beginning, and the seven minute timer went off twice, and I talked for at least three, four more minutes after that. So I um, just want to thank everybody for stopping by. Uh, I've got two more to record tonight. Hopefully I'll be a little more regular on these. Um, I'm already planning for Halloween. Oh, dude, if I could get these wines that I, f I found the other day, 
it would be epic. Well, epic only because the name is names of the wines and and the the Halloween show and all that. It'd be cool. I have no idea if the wines are epic, but I think it'd be fun. Um, it's a little bit really dark with far as what the names of the wine are, but I'm already looking for my Halloween wines uh, so I can theme it out and. Um, we will see everyone again next time.